Okay, we're going to do an overview of the brachial plexus and answer the what questions. What is the brachial plexus and what are its roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. Okay, so the brachial plexus is that right there. Now, the C5 and T1 spinal cord levels are what comprise and make up the brachial plexus, and there's our spinal cord, and those are the C5 to T1 spinal cord levels. Now, the brachial plexus is what provides the motor and sensory innervation to the upper limb. And so if we zoom in and we take a look at, oh, there's the dorsal root of the C5 level, and there's the sensory neuron coming in with its uh, cell body in the dorsal root ganglion, and there's the ventral root with the motor neuron coming out, and then the ventral and dorsal roots come together to make a spinal nerve trunk, and then the spinal nerve trunk is rise to a dorsal and ventral ramus, which is the exact same thing as this picture we've used in the past. Our roots make a spinal nerve trunk and the two rami. This is what occurs at each of the segmental levels between C5 and T1. Now, the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches are the divisions from proximal to distal of the brachial plexus, and it looks like this. There are the roots, there are the trunks in purple, there are divisions in red, there are the cords in green, and there are the terminal branches or branches in blue at the end. And so the way I remember this is through Randy Travis drinks cold beer. And if you don't know who Randy Travis is, then rugby teams drink cold beverages. So either way, the important thing to remember is that the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches are the divisions of the brachial plexus from proximal to distal. Now let's start with the roots. Now the roots of the brachial plexus are really another way of saying the C5 to T1 ventral rami. C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. And so the roots of the brachial plexus are the same thing is the ventral ramus at each of those segmental level. Not those roots, those roots. Thank you, anatomist, for making that so confusing. Now, the C5 to C8 roots course above their associated vertebra. So there we have this picture, and there are the C5 to T1 um, spinal nerves, and there are the associated vertebrae. And so let's zoom in a little bit and notice that there's the C5 nerve root coursing above the C5 vertebra, and the C6 nerve root above the C6 vertebra, C7 nerve above the C7 vertebra, and then, woo, there's this weird thing because we actually have eight cervical spinal nerves and only seven cervical vertebrae. And so the C8 nerve courses below C7 and above T1, and then when we go to the T1 vertebra, everywhere below this, the nerve associated with the vertebra courses below it. So T1 nerve below T1 vertebra, T2 nerve below T2 vertebra. Cervical vertebrae and nerves are the exception. Okay, so some of the branches off the roots include one called the dorsal scapular nerve that innervates or levator scapulae and rhomboid muscles. And so there is the uh, C5 root and there is the dorsal scapular nerve coming from the C5 root and it innervates our levator scapulae, rhomboidus minor, and rhomboidus major muscles. Another branch is called the long thoracic nerve that innervates our serratus anterior. So there is the C5, C6, and C7 contributions from C5, C6, and C7 roots that then make our long thoracic nerve that descends superficially and innervating the uh, superficial to the serratus anterior and innervates our serratus anterior. And I have a hand surgeon colleague who told me that this is how he remembers it. Roses are red and violets are blue and the serratus anterior is innervated by the long thoracic nerve. I thought that was very funny. It made me laugh. It's like anatomy laugh. Not so much Ellen DeGeneres funny, but like anatomy funny. Okay, so uh, a couple of things about the roots to remember. First is that each brachial plexus root, those things, have an associated dermatome, and a dermatome is an area of skin innervated by a specific spinal nerve level. And so there are our dermatomes. So the C5 root with the C5 dermatome, C6 root, C6 dermatome, C7 root, C7 dermatome, C8 root, C8 dermatome, T1 root, T1 dermatome. So the thing to remember is this. Sensory neurons in each upper limb dermatome course to an associated brachial plexus root. Another thing to remember is each brachial plexus root 
have an associated myotome. And a myotome is a movement associated with a specific spinal nerve level. And so there's the C5 root. It is associated with abduction of the shoulder. C6 root associated with flexion of the elbow. C7 root, extension of the elbow. C8 root, finger flexion. T1 root, finger abduction. So the thing to remember is this. Motor neurons from each brachial plexus root course to an associated upper limb myotome with an associated movement. Okay, so now let's talk about the trunks of the brachial plexus. And so roots give rise to trunks, upper, middle, and lower trunks, sometimes known as superior, middle, and inferior. So there's the C5 and C6 roots that go shing, make the upper uh, trunk. And then the C8 and T1 roots go shing and make the lower trunk. And then the C7 root, well, it just continues as the middle trunk, the only contribution. And so a couple of nerve, well, only one nerve branch we'll focus on is the suprascapular nerve that innervates our supra and infraspinatus muscles. So there is the upper trunk. So the C5 and C6 levels going into the upper trunk, making our suprascapular nerve, which then innervates our supra and infraspinatus muscles named according to their association with the spine of the scapula. Um, now, the roots and trunks together exit between our anterior middle scalene muscles. So there we have our anterior middle scalene muscles, and there are the brachial plexus roots and trunks just above the clavicle. And then as well, there's the subclavian artery that squeezes between those two muscles as well. So when we zoom in, there's something called an interscaling block that when we take a look at this surface anatomy, and there's our clavicle in the supraclavicular region, uh, there's our subclavian artery, and there's our brachial plexus, and the X marks the spot of where you would put this block between our scalenes to knock out the brachial plexus right there. This is really good for shoulder, arm, and elbow. Not as much for forearm and hand because the inferior uh, roots and trunks are below that, but it's really good for a, an access to at least shoulder and arm and elbow uh, and that's uh, knocking out for sensation. All right. Next, we'll talk about divisions of the brachial plexus. And so the trunks give rise to anterior and posterior division. So the upper trunk has an anterior and posterior division. The middle trunk bifurcates into an anterior and posterior division. And the lower trunk bifurcates into anterior and posterior divisions as well. Now, why? What's the deal here? So to answer this, let's talk about embryology for a second. Here's a cross-section through a developing embryo, and there's the developing limb bud. And so in this developing limb bud are bones, and in the bones have a dorsal and ventral muscle mass, muscles that form ventrally and dorsally to these bones. And so what we see is the following. The anterior division of the brachial plexus then sends their axons to the ventral muscle mass, which are flexors. And the posterior division of the brachial plexus sends its motor neurons to innervate the dorsal muscle mass. And so what we see is the anterior division of the brachial plexus innervates flexors, and the posterior division of the brachial plexus innervates extensors, basically muscles in front of and muscles behind the bones. And then another thing is the ventral muscle mass forms all the intrinsic hand muscles, which is why the anterior division of the brachial plexus just innervates hand muscles intrinsic hand muscles, and the dorsal muscle mass ends in the forearm. Their tendons go into the hand, but no intrinsic muscles of the hand are innervated by the uh, posterior division. So there are no branches associated with the divisions of the brachial plexus, but I thought it's helpful to know why there are these divisions in the brachial plexus. Next, we're going to talk about chords. And so the divisions then give rise to three chords. They're named in relation to the axillary artery. So there's our axillary artery that's in blue. I wish I'd drawn it in red, but it's, there's that uh, axillary artery. And then there's a lateral and medial cord named in their relationship to this axillary artery. And then deep to it, I've tried to ghost it out, is the posterior cord. Let's do that again, except with this picture right here. There is our axillary artery, and lateral is the lateral cord, medial is the medial cord, and deep, shing, is the posterior cord right there. Now some of the branches that come off. Well, the lateral cord branches are as follows. There's our lateral cord, and it gives rise to one branch, the lateral pectoral nerve that innervates our pectoralis major. Lateral pectoral nerve innervates the pectoralis major muscle. Then the medial cord, which is there, has 
The medial pectoral nerve is one of its three branches that innervates both the pec major and minor. There's our medial pectoral nerve, and it innervates both pec major and pec minor. Now, only on one side. It doesn't cross over, but this picture shows the pec major on one side, and then on the other side, the pec major is dissected to show the pec minor. So it would go through both, and it looks like this. So there we have our lateral pectoral nerve here that then courses out and innervates our pec major, and then the medial pectoral nerve right there that courses and pierces and innervates our pec minor and continues out to the pectoralis major. And so even though the medial pectoral nerve kind of looks lateral, these two nerves are named by their uh, origin on the cords of the brachial plexus. Now, other medial cord branches include the medial cutaneous nerves of the arm and forearm, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So when we look at this picture, there's our branches of the medial cutaneous nerves of the arm providing sensation to that region. It's also called the medial brachial cutaneous nerve. And then there's our medial cutaneous nerves of the forearm in that region, also called medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. All right, so the posterior cord and its branches, so there's our posterior cord, and there's three branches, upper and lower subscapular nerves that innervate our scapularis muscle. There's our upper and lower subscapular nerves, and it innervates that muscle, the subscapularis, one of our rotator cuff. And then also we have the thoracodorsal nerve there, also called the middle subscapular nerve sometimes. It innervates our latissimus dorsi muscle. Okay, so... Okay, we're now going to talk about the branches, also known as the terminal branches of the brachial plexus. And so the terminal branches are derived from cords. And so when we take a look at the axillary, radial, musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerves, they're formed by the cords. So there is our posterior cord, and it gives rise to our axillary and radial nerves. Now, the lateral cord gives rise primarily to the musculocutaneous nerve, or the median nerve gives primarily to the ulnar nerve, and together the ulnar the lateral and medial cords give rise to the median nerve. And we look at this, it kind of looks like an M, kind of like that, the golden arches, where we have the musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerves, musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerves. I actually use that golden arches, that M, when I'm dissecting to find that brachial plexus. And so not only is McDonald's good for the terminal branches of the brachial plexus, also good for french fries, not so much for the creepy clown. That's why I've never seen the movie It. Okay, so now we're going to talk about each one of these terminal branches, starting with the axillary nerve that innervates our deltoid and teres minor muscles and the lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm. There's our axillary nerve, and it innervates our deltoid muscle and teres minor muscle. That teres minor is part of the rotator cuff. And then it also provides cutaneous innervation there to the lateral region of the shoulder. So it's called the lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, specifically the superior branch, also called the lateral brachial cutaneous nerve. Next, we'll talk about the radial nerve that innervates our triceps and forearm extensor muscles and has sensory branches, primarily the superficial cutaneous branch. There's our radial nerve there. And then there is our triceps on the back of the arm and our posterior forearm extensor muscles. Uh, the back of the forearm. So again, remember that dorsal musculature, the extensors. And then it also provides this superficial cutaneous branch to the back of the hand, so the back of the thumb, index, and square finger. Um, there's other sensory distribution of radial nerve, but this is the plain, main place that we test it. Next is the musculocutaneous nerve that innervates our biceps and brachialis muscles and gives rise to the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So there's our musculocutaneous nerve coming from that lateral cord. And it also innervates our corcobrachialis muscle, but it's more because the musculocutaneous nerve pierces that. But functionally, the biceps and the brachialis are the two functional muscles that we look at for clinically testing this musculocutaneous nerve. It also gives rise to this lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm that uh, provides sensation to the lateral forearm. It's also called our lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Okay, next is the median nerve that innervates the forearm flexors and thenar muscles and has a superficial cutaneous branch. There's our median nerve, and then it innervates forearm flexors like ponator teres, flexor carpi radialis, and our palmaris longus muscles. Uh, it also innervates deep to that the flexor digitorum superficialis, and also deep to that, it does the flexor digitorum profundus. Now, the radial half, and radial half because it's the two... Uh, the belly that's closest to the radius, and so the radial half only, as well as our flexor pollicis longus that uh, flexes your thumb. 
Um, it also does athenar muscles that are associated intrinsic muscles of the thumb, as well as our first and second lumbrical muscles. Um, the sensation are as follows. So the superficial cutaneous branches of the median nerve are there. That does the volar or palmar surface of the thumb, index, square finger, and the radial half of your index of your um, ring finger, and then the dorsum of your thumb, index, square finger, and part of the ring finger. And finally, our ulnar nerve innervates the flexor carpi ulnaris, half of the flexor digitorum profundus, a bunch of the intrinsic hand muscles, and the superficial cutaneous branches. So there's our ulnar nerve coming primarily from that uh, medial cord, and it innervates the only muscle in the floor in the flexor compartment of the forearm that has the word ulnar in it, the flexor carpi ulnaris, and the deepest compartment there is our flexor digitorum profundus, but specifically only the ulnar half, the half that's closest to the ulna bone that goes to your ring and, and pinky fingers. Um, it also does, for intrinsic hand muscles, the hypothenar muscles, these intrinsic muscles that go to the pinky, as well as our third and fourth lumbrical muscles. And in addition to those intrinsic hand muscles, it does the palmar interossei muscles, called the pads, because these muscles, the palmar interossei, adduct the digits, and dorsal interossei muscle, called dabs, because these muscles abduct the digits. Um, now, sensation, the superficial cutaneous branches will do the uh, medial half of the palm of the hand, the pinky, and the ulnar half of your ring finger on um, both the front and the back of the hand. So there are the terminal branches. And that, my friends, is the brachial plexus in a nutshell. Mm -hmm.